Thank you all for being here. My name is Gideon Pollock, and I'm the rector, which is to say the priest in charge here at St. John's. And it's a real delight to welcome you all here and to be able to gather to celebrate this beautiful addition to our church. Today, we dedicate a new meditation garden, a space designed for spiritual reflection and connection with nature. When Steve approached me with his idea of a meditation garden in memory of his late and much beloved wife, Irene Gebrud Finch, I was deeply moved. It had been a simmering dream of mine to extend our worship space outdoors for some time. We have, of course, this beautiful bluestone patio, but the worship I wanted to offer was the kind of ecstatic, private, and spiritual experience of meeting God in the beauty of creation. Irene, in whose memory this garden is given, was many things. A loving and devoted spouse to Steve, of course, an incredible and decorated singer, obviously. But she was also a dedicated practitioner and leader in meditation. She believed that her meditation practice was a deep and abiding source of spiritual strength. Additionally, you know, Irene and Steve loved being outdoors together. Steve is a devoted hiker and climber, and he helped Irene get out into nature and connect with nature and with God. Together, they traveled to their beloved Aspen annually. They visited family and friends, many of whom we're happy to have here with us today. They made birding pilgrimages, and Steve's devotion to Irene was obvious to us all as he lovingly accompanied her and supported her on these many journeys. Psalm 84, which is our church's adopted psalm, says this. How dear to me is your dwelling, O Lord of hosts. My soul has a desire and longing for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh rejoice in the living God. The sparrow has found her a house and the swallow a nest where she may lay her young by the side of your altars, O Lord of hosts, my King and my God. I often think and sometimes say that it was a particular genius of my predecessor, Carlson Lee, to pick this psalm for the celebration of St. John's Day because it feels as though the psalmist was writing about this place. The psalmist continues, those who go through the desolate valley will find it a place of, filled with springs, for the early rains have covered it with pools of water. While sparrows we have and swallows we have, nests in abundance we have them, pools of water we have them also, blessings from God are all in abundance here. And before this garden, we were deeply blessed by the natural beauty of this spot, but now, we are even more blessed. This garden offers a dedicated space for contemplation, which I sometimes call intentional regarding. It's a practice that can be a deep source of joy and strength, allowing us to feel more connected to God through the beauty of creation. Now, if you all remember this hillside before we transformed it, you will remember that it was beautiful, but it was wild and impenetrable. Kevin Escobar and his team at the Roxy Group reshaped the hillside and transformed it with this grotto, this beautiful pond and waterfall, and all of its pathways. And the, you know, this gazebo, the arbor, and the benches, although they are all new, have been here for decades, perhaps even a hundred years, because they are largely constructed from the trees that grew on this site prior to the construction of the garden. The, those items, the gazebo, the arbor, the benches, these are all the work of skilled craftsman and artist Steve Caroline, who was inspired by Rusty Schmidt and Steve Finch. Our landscape architect, Rusty Schmidt, along with Steve, showed great devotion to using native species in the design of this garden. And this creates an even deeper connection to our dedication to this place. The garden is largely native, 
reflecting the natural beauty of our local ecosystem. And here I want to say a few, a few thank yous. First and foremost, I want to thank Steve Finch. Steve, your gift of vision to honor Irene in this way is truly remarkable. Everything here has been touched and lovingly shaped by your guiding inspiration. Thank you. I also want to say a word of thanks in absentia to Rusty Schmidt, our landscape architect. Rusty has been a keen collaborator with Steve on the design of this project, and together, their devotion to using native species in this design, the design of this garden, is an even deeper connection and dedication to our sense of place here in our hallowed spot in Long Island. And obviously, we owe a great debt of thanks to Kevin Escobar and his team from the Roxy Group, who reshaped the hillside and transformed it with our grotto, pond, waterfall, and pathways. We're also great grateful to Griffin McPherson and the scouts of Troop 218, who were tremendously helpful in helping us keep our costs down by coordinating and executing our collaborative planting day. And we all look forward to Griffin's upcoming Eagle Court of Honor, which is truly deserved. And I also want to thank my beloved colleague Mary Beth Mills Curran for her project leadership and management. As many of you know, this project has taken years to accomplish. And Mary Beth provided crucial leadership and support throughout that process. And finally, many of us committed time and funds to complete this project as sponsors, donors, and friends of St. John's Church. To all of you, those whose names we know and those who wish to remain anonymous, thank you. This meditation garden is more than just a beautiful addition to our church grounds. It's a living testament to Irene's spirit, and it is a gift to our entire community. As we dedicate this space today, we look forward to the many ways in, win, in with, the many ways it will enrich our spiritual lives in the years to come. Here, amidst these native plants, the soothing sounds of water and the craftsmanship that surrounds us, we've created a sanctuary for quiet contemplation and connection with God. And whether you come here to meditate, to pray, or simply to find a moment of peace in the busyness of a day, this garden offers us a unique opportunity to experience the divine in nature. And we envision this space being used for individual reflection, for small group gatherings, even guided meditation sessions, perhaps painting on plein air. And it's our hope that this garden will become a cherished part, not just of our church, but also our community's life, helping us all to deepen our faith and find renewal in the beauty of God's creation. And in creating this garden, we've not only honored Irene's memory, but also literally planted seeds for our community's spiritual growth. So let us nurture this gift with gratitude and care, allowing it to flourish and bear fruit in our lives and in the lives of all who visit here. And before we do anything else, I want to invite Steve to say a few words about his inspiration for and his dedication to this project, and then we'll dedicate it and bless it. Steve? Thank you, Gideon. Thank you all so much for being here. It is it does my heart so good to see so many friends, dear and near, and that you are here. Um, I would like to especially welcome uh, Irene's brother, Daryl, who is here from Minneapolis, niece Kim from San Diego, and niece Lori from Richmond, Virginia, representing all three of her brothers, who the other two could not be here for this occasion. This beautiful garden is not only a place of beauty, but it's a, a place with meaning, personal, spiritual, and religious. The idea as you heard, originated after Irene died about three and, a, three and a half years ago. And you know, she was a classic singer, and Gideon told you about her deep personal faith, faith and love of nature. And one thing that Gideon might not remember, he said at its inception that this place would be a tribute, this garden would be a place that is quiet, intimate, and serene, an outdoor sanctuary for the soul. Those are his words, I found. The design aesthetic is loosely borrowed from Japanese gardens as they are intended as a place of tranquility and inward contemplation. 
you are welcomed and drawn in by the entrance arbor here, which eventually will have vines and flowers covering it. The small pavilion above is the perfect place to sit quietly or view the activity of the, the birds, fish, turtles, passing of occasional passing of a muskrat in the, over in, through the pond. The grotto, such as this one, where Jesus often went to pray overlooking the Sea of Galilee. A stream like relationships divides and then comes back together. Importantly, the lower garden is handicap accessible. The upper garden allows a vista to the glory and vastness of God's creation. There's the stillness below of a small pond holding a place, a place for a sculpture. Right now there are plants there just waiting for a vision of a sculpture with St. John's Pond beyond. And as Gideon said, all the plants are uh, native, mostly native. They're perennials and shrubs and trees that come back year to year. There's even a turtle, symbol of longevity. And see if you can find the turtle. The entrance harbor pavilion and benches, as Gideon said, were milled from black walnut, a huge black walnut tree that was here, and a black cherry tree. The two end uh, support struts, horizontal, I forgot what they're called, one, are from that black cherry cut in half, and as is one of the vertical members, the whole roof structure of the pavilion is made from the black walnut tree, and if you go inside, you'll see that there's not a nail in it. It is totally pegged together, with, of course, the exception of the flooring and the, and the shingles, but the rest is all hand done with pegs, and uh, the benches are from with beautiful, beautiful live edge benches are all from the site, from the black walnut that's on the site. Even the railing that goes up the left side is, for, is black locust, which is very native from here, although these particular trees are from uh, Shelter Island and uh, brought them in. They will stay in the ground forever. They don't basically don't rot. The brick structure on which you, got, you guys are standing those bricks, for those of you who have been around this church for any length of time, before the restoration, before the renovation, those bricks were the, the walkways to the church where the Bluestone Walk is now. They were digging them up, going to throw them away because it, it cost too much money to process them. So I came and I took them. <laughs> I piled them in my SUV day after day, load after load, took up over a thousand of them and uh, brought them to my house where they've been living, waiting for a use. And uh, when this came up, I said, this is the perfect place for them. So they've returned from whence they came. They were made just over the hill here. They're Nassau bricks. Some, some words from poets and people who know more and express better than I do. In the last century, the British poet and, and artist, Minnie uh, Omonier wrote, there's always music amongst the trees in the garden, but our hearts must be very quiet to hear it. When the world wearies and society ceases to satisfy, there is always the garden. Henry David Thoreau believed in God as creator, a God who is alive and lives in his creation, nature. Heaven is under our feet as well as over our heads. And then, very moving, Anne Frank spent 761 days in an attic with a just a view out to the world from a small window where she could view the piece of the sky, birds flying by, and a chestnut tree. And she was about 14 when she wrote, the best remedy for those who are afraid, lonely, or unhappy is to go outside, somewhere where they can be quite alone with the heavens, nature, and God. Because only then does one feel that all is as it should be, and that God wishes to see his people happy amidst the simple beauty of nature. As long as this exists, and it certainly always will, I know that then there will always be comfort for every sorrow, whatever the circumstances may be. And I firmly believe that nature brings solace in all troubles. Gideon has all, already mentioned the place of, of gardens in, in the Psalms, but the Bible begins with a garden, and it ends with a garden, with some very other significant gardens in the middle. In the Bible, the story of man begins with the Garden of Eden. Then the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he made. 
He made all sorts of trees grow up from the ground, trees that were beautiful and that produced delicious fruit. In the middle of the garden, he placed the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. This was the place where Adam and Eve met God in the cool of the evening and how peaceful it must have seemed. The next really important garden is New Testament and that's the Garden of Gethsemane. It was a place where Jesus liked to go and pray alone. It must have been a quiet, peaceful place where he could withdraw from crowds that greeted him after his triumphal entrance into Jerusalem. Then Jesus went to a garden called Gethsemane and told his disciples, stay here and go a while over there and pray. Well, I go over there, sorry, and pray. And it was there that Jesus was betrayed by Judas. And very shortly thereafter, the third important biblical garden is near Golgotha. In this garden, Jesus was placed in a, new, in a new empty tomb. It would have represented such sadness to Jesus' followers, but it's here that the good news of the resurrection was announced to Mary Magdalene, who at first thought Jesus was the gardener. This garden became the garden of victory, which leads us into our final garden, the garden in the Bible, the heavenly garden, the garden of eternal life, from the last chapter of the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, flowing with water as clear as crystal, continuously pouring out from the throne of God and the Lamb. The river was flowing in the middle of the street of the city, and on either side of the river was the tree of life. In the first garden, we lost our connection to God, in the second garden, we find God in the midst of life's trials and difficulties, while in the third garden, we find hope in the resurrection. The final garden is the place of ultimate victory of faith over death. Every garden represents a different stage of our faith journey. Like faith, a garden is always changing, every garden is renewing itself, and God is present in every garden. My hope is that you can find great joy, peace, and comfort in the beauty of this garden. Thank you. We give you thanks for the beauty of earth and sky and sea, for the richness of mountains, plains, and rivers, for the songs of birds and the loveliness of flowers. Accept this offering of a garden as a gift of thanks and praise for these good gifts and in beloved memory of Irene Gebrut Finch whose love for you, for our community, for Steve, and for nature we seek to honor with this meditation garden. Let this space inspire us into a deeper commitment to safeguarding and healing your beautiful creation. Grant that we may continue to grow in our grateful enjoyment of this, your abundant creation, and may find ourselves deeply connected to you and one another as we meditate on your generous love in this place. And we bless this garden in the name of the Father who created, the Son who redeemed, and the Holy Spirit who enlivens, one God, and in beloved memory of Irene, whose faith and love inspired. <laughs>